Welcome to Disruptor in Chief, a show about the ongoing revolution in higher education. Let's hear from the main man leading the charge at Maryville University. Here's your host, Dr. Mark Lombardi. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Disruptor in Chief here at Maryville University. I'm Dr. Mark Lombardi, the president of Maryville, and this is a really special podcast because we're going to get a chance to to visit with and to to hear from and to, and Joanne Soliday, who is a uh, educational pioneer and and also a great friend. Let me tell you a little bit about Joanne. Uh, in addition to being a higher education author, speaker, a presidential advisor, she's also been a catalyst for change. With over 30 years of experience in college and university campuses, she's had a role in transforming those environments with her strategic vision and her ability to speak the truth, which, as we know these days, is in short supply. Um, 20 years of leadership positions at Elon University and at West Virginia Wesleyan College, or alma mater. Joanne then founded Credo, a higher education consulting firm dedicated to empowering small and independent colleges and universities and helping them to thrive. And her work with over 250 colleges and universities has led to some great success stories. She's the author of uh, two excellent books on higher education, and I know one of them is because uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to help her out as a co-author, Pivot, A Vision for the New University. Uh, actually, she did the writing, and I just basically poured the coffee, but uh, but it was great to work with Joanne on that book. So it was a little bit of shift today. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Joanne, and Joanne is going to pepper me with questions and try to catch me in several untruths. So hopefully that won't happen. But Joanne, welcome. It's great to have you. Oh, it's great to be here, Mark. Thanks so much for inviting me. And I was thinking a little bit before we got together this morning that we really had no idea when we wrote Pivot that there was going to be a pandemic. And That's I remember true. conversations about how in the world will we get everybody to at least even learn to go online and learn to do the kind of education that uh, we thought was going to be transformational. And then all of a sudden, everybody had to do it in a couple of weeks. So yeah, um, I, we, were I, geniuses. we were geniuses. We were. And the debate is going to go on forever. Was it the pandemic or the pivot book that transformed it? I, it, it there's going to be people on both sides of that debate. <laughs> Well, the biggest thing we talked about so much during the book, and, and I want you to speak about it because you've done such a beautiful job of it there at Maryville. It, we talked about how will we change the leadership piece? How will we make it um, different? How will we get that courage we wanted out of leaders to do the things that needed to be done? And for you and for me, this was a lot about access and student success. And so we knew that leadership needed to change to do that, but we also knew that it was going to be hard to change our culture in higher ed. So talk a little bit about how you've done that at Maryville. How have you changed culture? Well, the, you know, it's it's been a first. It's been a process, right? It, it and I think everyone would know it. it those types of things, those changes, don't happen overnight. But what we what we did was we 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 really started out uh, addressing what I call the three C's: courage, uh, uh, culture, uh, as you mentioned, and consensus. And and here's how we did it: in changing the culture, you don't go to a community of of uh, academics or any uh, organizational institutional community and say, "Hey, gang, we need to change our culture, and here's how you do it." That's the worst thing you can do. What we did was we changed the rules of the game, meaning we changed how we did things. So, if we said, "Well, we've got to introduce a new computer science degree," Uh, that's more cutting edge and aligned with industry. But here's how we're going to do it. We're going to design it within a matter of weeks. We're going to pilot it and deliver it quickly. And we're going to assess it. So we didn't necessarily change some of the things we did. We changed the pace. We operated at high speed. We were very flexible. And, and bringing into the consensus part, we basically threw out the notion that we would achieve any kind of consensus about anything. Because the, the drive to achieve consensus in any organization, it thwarts change. It eliminates risk taking. It waters down good ideas to things that everyone can agree on. And as you know better than anybody, the only thing you can get the entire academic community to agree on is the need for more parking. Everything else is open to uh, argument and debate and discussion. So 
what we did was we found and we developed some key initiatives, our one-to-one initiative with the iPad and the active learning ecosystem, new degree programs, online education, which we referenced before. And we said, look, we're not going to ask permission to do these things. We're not going to try to achieve consensus. We're going to do them and pilot them and learn from them and use them to build upon. And so so the way we changed the culture was we did things differently. We didn't try to get everyone's agreement on everything. We used that, as you and I know, that great strategy of piloting things and getting data and information to leverage uh, further change. And then the other part really was we created a culture of risk taking. So risk taking and new ideas are rewarded. They're not tamped down. They're not, hey, you know. So you're not the young faculty member and you've got a great idea for something and somebody says, wait till you get tenure before you introduce that. We said, we said, no, and ideas can come from anywhere. Students, faculty, staff, empower those ideas, resource them, support them. And you cre- over time, you create a culture that, that begins to really accept those values and, and in the process rejects those old, what I call 20th century traditional educational values of, you know, deliberate for years and have committees meet forever and wait till everyone is comfortable and agrees. In, a, in an environment of change and, 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 and rapid development of education, healthcare, we could talk Talk about a lot of verticals. Uh, you, you, there is no comfort level with change. You have to embrace the discomfort, and then you have to move through it and plow through it. So, uh, in many ways, in a, in a thirty thousand foot level, that's what we did. There were dozens, as you know, of examples of how we did that that are kind of fun and, and interesting now to talk about. But uh, and and there was struggle and there was opposition at times. But that's the courageous part of it, uh, Joanne. You, if you're I've said this before, the greatest impediment to change in higher ed are not faculty, it's presidents. And it's presidents' reluctance to sort of take the initiative and to step out there and courageously advocate for what they know uh, needs to happen. And the pandemic is a perfect example. You had all these presidents that were concerned about whether or not to go online and how to do it and whatever. And then it was forced upon them. And now it's a fait accompli and it's a reality of today's educational world. It's the truth. And I, I remember when we talked about this as over and over during the year we were writing the book, we the thing that got the most attention in the book that we spoke to more and more is this consensus piece. Remember, we would we would we thought there were a lot of other questions that people would ask, but they've asked about this consensus because it was really ingrained in our culture in higher ed, wasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, a lot of. You know, you even if you bring in uh, uh, consultants or you bring in different entities, uh, you bring in an architectural firm, for example, that's looking to design a academic building or whatever. And the first thing on their list is we need to get the input and the agreement of all the stakeholders, right? And and you know, it, it's it, it's sort of like saying we're going to have fifty family members over for Thanksgiving, but they all have to agree on how to cook the dinner. And if if and and if that happens, it's it's going to be awful. So what usually happens is either your grandmother or your grandfather or whoever says, everybody get out of the kitchen, I'll do it. <laughs> and it comes out great. So uh, yeah, there it, there was a lot of opposition and a lot of kind of psychological um, dissonance around this notion that everyone has to agree. But see, the, the beauty of, uh, of changing a culture, and you know this as well as anyone that when you ing- when you pilot and you do several things and they successfully work to the point where people want to be a part of it, that success, those successes, and they can be small successes at times, they build upon themselves. And then all of a sudden people realize, no, I want to be a part of that success. I want to be a part of what those initiatives are. And they become focuses of energy that draw other people in who normally would have been fence sitters, then they become, they want to become part of the, part of the experience. So that's what we found is it's, uh, it's not rejecting uh, people's involvement. It's saying, we're not going to ask everybody's opinion off the top. We're going to do something. We're going to get the feedback. We're going to make it better. And then we invite you to participate. 
And that's the that's the model that we've had at Maryville that's really worked successfully. And and I know at other universities they've done it too. But we really and and now by the way it's part of our culture. Uh, you know it's it's just ingrained uh, that way. And and that's exciting to see. Yeah, I think we 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 intersected because we were both thinking pilot, pilot, pilot for so long that that was going to be one of the instruments of change. And I'm going to push you a little bit on that. I want you to talk about one of them. Just choose one and talk about a pilot where that happened. Yeah, I know you've got lots of them. Choose one and talk a little bit. Well, uh, the the one to one initiative and the work with Apple when when uh, in in 2014 went out to Cupertino myself and a couple of colleagues talked to the people at Apple saw a great presentation and so forth and so on about learning design and learning theory came back and said we need to do this we need to put this amazing tool in the hands of our students we made the decision to go with the iPad uh, within two weeks of that meeting at at senior level. Then the question was, OK, how do we involve faculty and staff in in this? We said, look, we're going to bring them together, but we're going to give them a focal point, which is design a plan for implementation or to pilot this for our first year students. And we brought a group of faculty and staff together. And the first thing they said in the meeting when I was there was, oh, we can't possibly. I said, it's August. I said, we want to plan by December. We can't possibly do that. We're going to need a year and a half. No, no, by December, we can't. And then they said, well, if we design a plan, what if you won't resource it? I said, I guarantee you, you'll get all the resources you need. They asked that question three times. Finally, someone said, shut up. He said, we're going to get all the money we need. So don't argue anymore. And here's what happened. These good people who were skeptical, who weren't sure about it, some of them were, you know, Microsoft people and PC people. They ne they're never going to use a Mac or an iPad. And they came up with a report, not in December, but in October, six weeks early. We Then we took that, we took that plan and we turned it over to the faculty who were Pied Pipers who were already using these devices and using them very effectively. And we said, you take over the faculty development side of this peer to peer. And by in December, they had these sessions where they where they did workshops. By the time we got to the end of May, which is and we were going to implement the initiative in, in the next, following fall with first year students. We had 90 percent of our faculty trained in how to use the iPad. And 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 then once it was implemented and the stu the learning took off and the students loved it and whatever, then we went we ran the pilot. We evaluated it. The data was clear and irrefutable. And then we said, OK, starting the following year, every student, regardless, will get an iPad. And once the pilot was successful and the faculty Again, we didn't ask their permission to do it. We said, we want you to orchestrate the implementation of it. The decision to do has already been made. We went, Once they took ownership over that, it took off like wildfire, and they deserve the success. They deserve the credit for its success. So it really was uh, um, this idea of, of making a decision, which is the leadership part and the courageous part in terms of not leaving it up to this this striving for for ephemeral consensus and then empowering faculty and staff to implement it. And we've used that same formula probably a dozen other times with other initiatives. Yeah, the, you got buy in all the way through. And so we've used that word courageous a lot. Um, you and I talk about that a lot. And we talk a lot, a lot about that here at Credo. One of the one of the things I think you did at Maryville that I watched and I, I really would like you to talk a minute about it is you brought that courage all the way to your board of trustees. You really did. And that that is different, too. You said it's all up to the president and it really is. You've got to be there. You've got to be ins inspirational. But you've got to have a board of trustees behind you that really understands and talk a minute about what you did to get that board to a place where they were courageous, too. Well, let me pre let me preface the answer by saying the president of a university has two primary constituencies, students and the board of trustees. That doesn't mean the other constituencies aren't important, alumni and faculty and staff. And so everything is about the student, but or and 
your board has to understand where you're going, the vision, the direction or whatever before anybody else does, because the board ultimately can be a passionate and incredibly supportive advocate or a, uh, a incredibly powerful opposition to what's happening. So we spent the time, we, we brought the board together in vision sessions, and, and I know you were a part of that, Joanne, and we brought them together and did workshops, and we spent hours with all the key board members, helping them understand the the benefits of, of, for example, the benefits of every student having an iPad. We leveled the socioeconomic playing field from a technology standpoint. We gave every student access to over 200 apps for free. We trained uh, and educated our students and faculty about how to use them. We educated our board completely and in detail about the power of this, and they, they became absolute passionate advocates for and so that investment by them, not just financial, but in, in vocal and, and educated support was huge as we move through the different constituencies and work with different groups and introduced it. And, and um, but that takes what that takes primarily is time and energy. You know, there are some presidents out there that like to keep their board at, at an arm's length. Uh, basically, uh, my analogy is in, invite them into the tent early and get them excited and, and, and understanding about what you're doing. And they're tremendous allies. Oh, I know, Mark. I'll never forget the the interview I did with one of your board members. Um, it's just ingrained in my head. It, it it will be forever. When I said, "What makes you want to be a Maryville board member?" and he said, "You know, I've done a lot of important things in my life, but to think that I've made a difference in the learning of people is the thing that really captures my heart." And he had big had tear in his eye. And I just thought, oh, if every board member could have that kind of feeling and that kind of passion around what we do in higher education. So so that was pretty cool. So you talked a little bit about the board. You've talked a little about bringing the uh, the faculty along. And I, I want you to and, and you've talked a little bit about consensus. Are there other things in our older model of higher education that you believe are going to have to change? Some trends you see happening out there that we're going to have to make changes in? Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of them, and and we talk about it in the book, uh, seniority. Uh, higher ed is an is an is a culture that literally worships seniority. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking about tenure. I'm talking about the idea that there's such a stratified hierarchy among faculty and staff. And the, pro the fundamental problem with that is not that people who are in their 60s or 70s don't have great ideas. Of course they do. I mean, we've got innovative people who are 75 and 25 or 18 on our campus. It's that when you create structures over time that basically say senior the seniority people are the ones that are the gatekeepers of any good ideas or good uh, direction. So what you got to do is chip away at that. And we did that. You do that in a lot of small and big ways, how you create task forces to address things, how you empower people. How do you get Think of it this way. You, we, have stu we have dozens of students who've designed and built their own apps, right? One student, for example, designed an app for the homeless uh, and homeless shelters in St. Louis to help people find, help homeless find uh, places where they can be, particularly in inclement weather and so forth. We've got all these great ideas. And if somebody feels like they can't present that or bring that idea forward because they don't have the seniority or the chops, that's the antithesis of innovation. It's the antithesis of, of risk taking. It's a way of keeping good ideas down. So you, we chipped away at all of that. We formed uh, when we did form committees around certain initiatives, we made sure that it, it, these were um, staff and faculty together, that they were uh, eclectic and diverse and also so had nothing to do with how many years you've been at the institution or 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 what your rank was. There there are reasons to have ranks, for example, among professors. And and there's nothing wrong with that, but there should never be any ranking around 
on good ideas or and or change initiatives or things of that nature. So that was a lot of little things we did to create a culture where uh, it didn't matter how long you've been here. What mattered was the power of your ideas. And it took a while. I'll, I'll be honest, it took a few years for and, and a lot of it. And I'll be very frank, Joanne, I, I spent and you know this, I spent a lot of time uh, offline with young faculty and meeting with them, sometimes off campus because they didn't want to be seen on campus with the president. You know, what are they doing? And he- hearing them out and then telling them, hey, bring those ideas, you know, and almost trying to create kind of a protective cloak around those people and, and letting them know that it didn't matter what their rank was. What mattered was their ideas. So seniority, and you know this, is a big one to chip away. And it's and it's a delicate one. Because it's not it's not an anti-age thing or an anti-experience thing. It's really more instead of looking at those variables, let's just look at the power of your ideas. Mm-hmm. You told me once, and I remember it, and you and you lived it, that you were going to take the people with the ideas and you were going to lift them up high, and and you did through articles and magazines and alumni uh, pieces and all those things. So it became sort of a culture at Maryville that if you could be innovative, if you could think outside of the box, um, you would be recognized in a lot of ways. Yeah. In fact, our... And we introduced a bonus system around that. We have monthly bonuses for faculty and staff, quarterly bonuses and yearly bonuses, and they're all built around innovative ideas. So uh, I, I think the monthly bo- uh, don't quote. I think the monthly bonus is a thousand dollars, and the quarterly is twenty five hundred, and on up the scale. And and there these and these people are recommended by their peers and recommended. Uh, I'm not choosing them. They're being chosen by their peers, really. And that's become part of the culture. In fact, and here's a great sign of this. When we introduced this and I talked with our faculty council officers about it, they wholeheartedly endorsed it. Uh, they didn't they didn't step away from it. In fact, they thought it was a great idea and they and they were very much in favor of it. And so that gives you an idea of how the culture had shifted. Yeah. You know, I'm uh, you and I, we talked a little bit about today and you said I can go off script if I want to. So I'm going off script. for All right. <laughs> we have I, a lot I, of fun when go on, going off script. Go off script. <laughs> well, I, I have gotten a chance to see some things because we've worked together in these past couple of years on some things. And and you've changed the way people work there. And I think that's an interesting thing for you to tell people about you. People work differently. Technology and the way you've used it has changed the way you think efficiency needs to be. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, I think because we're so focused on student outcomes, I think we're we're we have a laser focus on work outcomes. And and what that translates to both in simple and larger ways is, you know, and like obviously the pandemic brought this home, but but what you can produce, whether you're working from home, whether you're working, you know, we've got employees full time working in Austin, Texas, living in Austin, Texas and Denver, Colorado and all over. So we've empowered employees around the concept of what are the here's the outcomes and and how you produce those outcomes is less of concern than that you produce them. So it, it opens up the freedom of a lot of employees to do things in, in, in somewhat their own way, within reason, of course, but in ways that that really uh, allows them to find their uh, work style niche, if you will. So that's one big way. I think, uh, I think another way is, again, the incentive structure is such that that people get rewarded for really good ideas and for risk taking. And so that changes the dynamic a little bit from uh, from simply, uh, you know, I've got to be here from eight to five. And that's how I measure whether my work is successful or not. And I think the third thing that and, and, and there might be others, but the third thing that really jumps out to me is we've had a instead of having a a a, we have to fill job philosophy we have a talent recruitment philosophy so in fact we have uh, people on our in our hr office that their title is 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 talent recruiters talent coordinators the idea being that we're looking for people 
who have talents and who share our values and our direction. It's really not about where you went to school or, or what have you. Within reason, there's always credentials that are needed in certain jobs, but it's really about talent and passion and shared values. And, and we've really done that. I think successfully, there's a, we still have a lot more to do. And also that ties into that, of course, is putting uh, issues of DEI front and center, both in the search process, in the retention process, in the reward process. You know, we, we are not there yet. We've got a ways to go, but we've really done a, a good job of moving the institution in a diversity, equity, inclusion way to a point where uh, our, both our numbers – which are one way to measure, not the only, but also the culture and the the individual cultures within the community are are valuing and and embracing diversity, equity, inclusion at a much better in a much better way than they used to. Well, this talent thing is more of a disruptor than people listening might think until you see it in action, because you're actually and and I love the way you've thought about this is if a position opens. There's not necessarily a slim dunk, slam dunk that that position will get refilled. That's right. Disruptive. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. In fact, uh, well, we're in the middle right now of what they call the great resignation. Everyone else is, right? I mean, we average about 10 resignation or retirements a year, and we're up to probably 30 now because it's it's part of the pandemic and COVID and so forth. But at any given time when someone leaves, we that that position goes back into a general hopper, if you will. And then the, the conversations happen. Do we need that position, Phil? Do we, de- do, do we need another set of skills and talents and abilities there or in somewhere else? Because, look, you and I have talked about this a lot, I know, and, and I know how we both feel about this. We're in a we're in a period of rapid and accelerating change where careers and jobs are changing dramatically, where skills needed for jobs three years ago. Now you need a different set of skills to do those same tasks. And it's constantly changing, which means you have to constantly be evaluating and searching for talent and and you have to constantly invest in upgrading talent. So you might have a group of people in on your campus on Maryville, any campus where they're doing really good work, but they, they need to upskill to continue to do other work. Technology is a perfect example. You've got to have the professional development in place that supports that and helps that and invests in that uh, and, and not simply says, well, you, 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 were, you were good in IT three years ago, but you don't have this. So you're, that's not the way to go. The way is to invest in people and invest in their upskilling. And that's another part of the culture that that uh, that we again, I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but we we've invested a lot in trying to get there. Yeah, I know that's true. So I'm going to slip back to one of the words that we started out talking about, which is access. You've you are so passionate about access. Um, Both of our backgrounds make us talk a lot about how everybody should have access to education. But in particular, one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book with you is because of the ability for you all at Maryville to look innovatively at what adults need right now in the workplace. That was a big thing to me because it isn't just always about the four-year degree. It's always about what, who needs what in order to be relevant, right? That's and, right. And Maryville has had – you built on a strength there because there's a long history of relevance in education with adults. But you've taken it to a whole new level now. And talk a little bit about that. Well, sure. Uh, Well, obviously, in our School of Adult and Online, where we have roughly about 7,000 or more students, undergraduate and graduate studying online, and that's obviously degree-seeking, and that's growing, and that's been a big part of what we do. And we were ahead of the game, which is why we were able to adapt to the pandemic much more effectively. But we launched a year and a half ago something called Maryville Works, and this is non-degree-seeking workforce development programming Think of it in terms of workforce development certificates in which we go into companies and we we don't tell the company what they need. We say, what do you need? Mm 
And they might say to us, we've got 300 people in, in, in the IT cyberspace. We need to upskill them with a, with a workshop. We deliver those things largely on our online platform, which is so robust and, and effective using learning designers. And basically, if we can show a company that that value uh, of upskilling is going to both get a much better workforce for them, save them a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, then the, the partnership works effectively. Right now, we started a year and a half ago, we already have 2,600 what I call customers in that space. That's individual employees at companies. Now, this is different than than the old model, right? We're not going to each employee and saying, hey, come, come to Maryville on a Thursday night and we'll teach you how to do X. We're going to the employer. The employer buys subscriptions. So the employer says, I want 300 subscriptions for these certif- this certificate or these certificates. And then it's they put their employees, they decide who goes into those. And often uh, these, these types of programs are, and, and by the way, there's no grading. This isn't like a course. This is upskilling. Usually the final project that the people involved in this have is defined by the company itself. It's a work product uh, uh, project that the company evaluates. So it's non-degree seeking. It's not credit bearing. It's, it's on a subscription pay model basis. Usually the subscriptions run anywhere from three, 400 a person to upwards of 1,000 or 1,200, depending upon the subject matter. And we found uh, companies can't get enough of it. Uh, we found that it's growing rapidly. I'd, I'd say, Joanne, that probably in three years, it's likely we might have upwards of 100,000 people in that in that vertical uh, operating, not just here in St. Louis, but around the country. And, uh, and the thirst for it is enormous. It's just enormous. Well, the it, corporations just don't have what they need to provide uh, the education for the future. But you would say, and so I'm going to say it, that your ability to be agile in that arena has been part of the success. And well, about that. flexibility, agility, being nimble, these are goes back to changing the culture. Universities, traditionally, uh, the only uh, entity that's less agile and nimble than a university is probably uh, the Catholic Church. And I can say that I was raised Catholic. I mean... The, the, the idea that universities could move fast was, an, uh, you know, nobody even thought that. I mean, everybody thinks of universities as slow moving, like huge cruise ships of sorts. We brought that in agile, nimble, flexible, move quickly. Um, working with a company, we can design a program for them in seven weeks, not three years. In fact, all these CEOs, when I meet with them, they all tell me the same thing. They say, Hey, you guys, Maryville, you don't talk like a university. You talk like a business, number one. And number two, you can deliver on business time, not on academic time, which is a huge factor for any any industry. So we pride ourselves on that flexibility and agility moving fast. Early on in the culture, it took a while to educate people to the new time frame. You know, when they're used to saying, well, it's going to take us a couple of years to design this. And we said, no, it'll take you six or eight weeks. Uh, it, you know, it's sort of like working the muscles, right? You know, you, you don't go out there and run a marathon. You go out there and run a mile or two, and then you work your way up. But, but uh, we're at a place now where we can move quickly on all these initiatives and have. In fact, it's probably one of the main reasons we've been so successful is we've moved into spaces just much more quickly than any other university. Mark, do you think that that in itself, your ability to move um, with agility in that in that field, in the adult field, has impacted your undergraduate ability to make programs more relevant? And oh, huge. I mean, I can't. As a for as a uh, I I could still think of myself as a faculty member, but no faculty think of me that way. <laughs> they think of me as the president. But as a former faculty member, absolutely, because you know you can't make curriculum robust, vibrant, and current unless you're listening to the industries and the professions of which the, our students are going into, and you have to listen to them. You know, I'm just going to say, curriculum had always been designed in a vacuum. 
by faculty, and there's nothing wrong with faculty designing curriculum. It can't be done in a vacuum anymore. It has to be done with industry and others in the room saying exactly what they need now and what they need for tomorrow. So our undergraduate curriculum has been greatly and positively affected, and that's created greater vibrancy for our 18 to 22 year olds who are in those fields. So I guess the question that follows that, um, not one you and I ask ourselves a lot, but a lot of people ask it is, is there still room for the liberal arts? Of course. I mean, I, you know, I got a great, you got a great liberal arts education. I got a great liberal arts education. Here's the difference. The liberal arts are very, very important. They have to be taught and they have to be uh, reinvigorated with what I would call 21st century pedagogy and approaches. So um, I'm a passionate believer. I was a political scientist by training, but I'm a passionate believer in, in taking courses on Shakespeare because I think Shakespeare understood more about human nature and politics than, than most. You know, I, I used to tell my students in political science, you want to understand politics, read Shakespeare. And they'd look at me like I was crazy, but, but it was true. But, but, but again, it's how we teach these, right? It's how we, it's how we approach them. It's how we approach any of the liberal arts disciplines. And we've got some tremendous faculty here on our campus who are some of the most innovative, amazing teachers, and they're teaching what you would call traditional liberal arts disciplines. But it's the way you do it, and it's how you approach it, how you use the, how you use the tools of the trade, um, and the amazing tools we have today, not just online in these various platforms, but teaching strategies, learning design strategies, and by the way, very, very soon for us, how we use the metaverse as a way of educating our students about everything, including the liberal arts. So it's never, it should never be a choice in either or. It should be, how do we invigorate them? And let's face it, Joanne, you cannot teach students today liberal arts the way we were taught. It's a different world. We, you know, we were, we were of a generation that we would sit there in rows and write down everything the teacher said and then go back and you can't, that, that's not the way the world we live in today. And, and, and therefore that, that's incumbent upon us to creatively uh, address those kinds of uh, needs. And, and, you know, the, the, the thing I, I like to say is you, when you create a culture of the values that we've been talking about on this podcast, you end up attracting faculty who want to innovate and do amazing things. So that's the other thing. We've, we've had a great uh, um, track record now uh, the last few years of attracting all kinds of faculty from both the academic and non-academic worlds who embrace those values of flexibility, agility, innovation. And so, so you know, you, you build something and it, and it becomes a, you know, it, draw, it has a gravity that draws uh, like-minded people in. You know, there's, there'll be somebody listening um, to us talk who will want to know, who will say, well, how can you learn differently than, than a lecture? How do you learn different than sitting? <laughs> so talk for a minute about learning designers, about all of the pieces you've had to put together to, to turn that upside down. That's been a disruption in academia. So, uh, it has. And, and I'll put it this way, and this is how I try to explain it to people sometimes. So think of medical science. Think of all the advances over the last 50 years, okay? So think about all we've learned about heart surgery and, and the brain and the body and how doctors and surgeons and nurses approach healthcare very differently than 50 years ago. Now, think about the way we were educated 50 years ago in a largely lecture format. In the 50 years since, we've learned all kinds of things about learning theory, learning design. How do you learn, Joanne, as opposed to me? How you have visual and kinesthetic learners and you have, the brain works differently. And, and by the way, people learn differently based on gender, based on experience, based on uh, uh, other factors, based on age and maturity and brain development. We know so much more today than we did 50 years ago. Therefore, why would we want to teach the way we did 50 years ago when we have all this knowledge? So you take all this great research on learning design, learning, and you infuse it 
into the pedagogy and the approach, just like a doctor who the, the devices that a doctor used to perform open heart surgery 50 years ago are radically different today and, and much more um, technologically sophisticated, et cetera. You and I are wearing watches that can give us, tell our EKG, right? We're both. We're, how we sleep and how we sleep. Exactly. Exactly. And unfortunately, you know, that I'm having too much gin, which I don't like that about the watch, but that's a separate, separate issue. But we have this at our disposal. Why not infuse it into education and infuse it into teaching? And I'll give you a good example because it ties directly to access and opportunity. If we look at standardized test scores and GPAs or where you went to high school, we miss a tremendous amount of information about all the individual students we can recruit and bring in, their talents, their abilities. And then how do we adjust our pedagogy to tap into those talents and abilities. And, and, and that's why, by the way, that's one of the great, uh, frankly, uh, travesties about higher education in the 20th century is that um, a one-size-fits-all approach to instruction excluded thousands of young people, and particularly women and students of color and so forth, from getting gaining access to that education. Now that we have all these tools at our disposal, we can open up access and opportunity, which we're doing and others can do, and, and, and empower literally across the society millions who wouldn't have had the opportunity. Um, and, and that's the key. It's the key. And, and frankly, some of the real leaders in this are our psychology faculty, our science faculty, and our education faculty who are doing work in brain research and learning theory and what have you. And what's been exciting over the last few years is when those faculty get up and tell our other faculty, hey, let me explain to you how the difference between the way a 18-year-old uh, 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 woman uh, processes information in science and how a Manda and how you have to alter your tactics. Our faculty listen to those faculty, and it's been eye opening for them because you know not every faculty member can be an expert in learning theory and brain research. You know that that's that. So so to be able to learn from their peers and then put those things into practice, it's been uh, not just not just exciting and positive, but it's been almost heartwarming to see it happen. That's that's the piece that had your board member tearful. Uh, when he was talking to me, that he really felt like you were doing something at Maryville that was making a difference in the world because of that. And it does make me sad when I think about people I know who did not get the education they probably could have gotten if somebody had thought that they could learn a different way. Yeah. And it, it starts with a fundamental assumption that I've had for 40 years, frankly, in one degree or another. And it's this, none of us not you as a as a great accomplished educator, not me, not any of us, has really has the ability to look into the heart and mind of a 17-year-old high school student and decide whether they can be successful or not. We really don't. And and to to think to to convince ourselves and many do that they can is awful. It really shouldn't happen. What we've got to do is provide avenues of opportunity for those young people to find their talents. It may be at Maryville. It may be at Elon. It may, it may not be at a college. It may be in a different environment, but that's our job. Our job is not to decide who's going to win or lose before the race even begins. Our job is to give everybody an opportunity. Yeah, I remember when we started to write the book, we we actually said uh, that right now the best colleges seem to be judged by who they can keep out. That's right. We talked about that. And and yet we see the future and we wanted that's why we wanted to write as who will they be able to open up their arms to and how will they be able to provide a track that will be relevant and meaningful. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, you know, during the pandemic because of all the challenges, you know, and we had been we had been uh, a stand, we were stand uh, test optional for several years, but a lot of these Ivy League and other schools said, "Well, we're not going to this year we're we're going to put a moratorium on standardized testing." And 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 here's the interesting part. Uh, applications skyrocketed at Harvard and Yale whatever, even though the reality is they still used a whole bunch of other methods to basically exclude uh, as many because that's how you measure. So 
when you look at U.S. news rankings, and, and the, that's another area that's becoming more and more antiquated, obviously, 35% or something of the score is reputation. The other, uh, another percentage is the degree of selectivity. So the more people you let out, uh, you, the more people you keep out, the higher your score. And as you said, and, it's, and when you think about it in a certain way, it's preposterous. Every, the answer to every human problem humanity's problems, the answer to all of them is education. So then the, the next question be, or the next statement becomes, why then wouldn't you want to put a maximum amount of talent at trying to address those problems? Instead, universities, unfortunately, have, have created a scarcity model and limited access and opportunity over the decades. And as a result, you have less people who are able to work on solving those profound challenges. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I don't know about you, Joanne, but I'd much rather have 20 people in the room brainstorming on a problem than having than me sitting here in the dark trying to figure it out. I know. I know. It's absolutely the truth. So, so Mark, what's ahead? What are, what, are you still excited about higher education? Do we still have some things ahead of us that we have to do? I mean, everybody seems to think we should all be frustrated. I still get excited about what can be ahead. I, I've said this to you before. I think we're entering a golden era of higher education. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to have uh, 4,000 universities operating in the next few years. Unfortunately, a lot of universities will close for a variety of fiscal and other reasons. What it means, though, a golden era of higher ed means that hundreds of thousands and millions of people are going to have access and opportunity to education that didn't have before through online platforms, through workforce development platforms platforms through a variety of different platforms. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that I think are happening. We are, and I can't go into too much detail, but we are applying now artificial intelligence, sophisticated data analytics to create networks and platforms that can educate literally hundreds of thousands of, of people across all those different demographics and needs. Uh, that's one thing that we're doing right now that uh, probably we'll be introducing this year, right here, uh, right now in 2022. And the second thing that's coming, which I'm, as you say, I'm just so excited about, is this notion that in, in real time, in, on, you can operate, students can operate and flow between different platforms, whether it's online or the metaverse or in person or what have you, and apply these kinds of learning experiences in the real world for themselves, practically. Um, I, I'm trying to think of an easy analogy, but I'll use one that's near and dear to my heart. It's not educational, but I, well, it is, but I think it's, it's kind of neat. I love to cook. And of course, during the pandemic, I got a chance to really experiment more with cooking. And, and so, so what, I, what tool did I use? YouTube, right? You get, you, I YouTube videos of my favorite cooks and you experiment and you do different things. Imagine you're in a job situation, you're in an education, anything, and you're able to put on a pair of goggles or a pair of glasses, and you're able to put yourself in a practical situation in real time to learn about how you need to deal with that to then apply that in your job, your education. So I think we're entering a period now where there's going to be a fusion of platforms and a fusion of experiences where you can a student can literally pull from these different things in real time and educate themselves with the facilitated help of faculty and, and, and employers and colleges. It's not that they're not going to need college, but they can it, they can do that within this facilitative experience and environment. And I think I can't wait to see it all uh, kind of lay out because I think it's going to be incredible. Um, and I think young people today intuitively understand that this world is emerging. Uh, and people listening to this might say, when is that going to happen? It's already here. It's already here. There are companies that are already doing this. So we, we, it's just a question really for us, which we're doing is partnering with people and companies to implement this. And, and, and what I'm excited about is the power of the student outcomes that are going to come from that. It's just I know be that, incredible. that is the big thing for you and it and for me too, that student succeeding in the end. And and for Credo, that's what we all feel so good about. Students succeeding in the end is why we do the work that we do. 
So what did we miss, Mark? We talked about all the things we were passionate about when we were writing. Did we miss anything? Well, I think the 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 trends, all the things we talked about that have been done and are and are being done and will happen are also going to lead to something that's very important. The cost of higher ed is going to go down considerably and 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 that is going to open up access as well. I ideally where I would love to see higher ed is higher education would be like Netflix. You have an app, you have an experiences, and you pay a monthly fee, and you can access it for your entire life. So ideally, I want every student, everyone that that is affiliated and connected to Maryville, to ha- be able to access Maryville's education for life whenever they need it. And just like Netflix, right? If I want to go home and binge watch The Sopranos this weekend while I'm eating pasta and having some good red wine, I can do it. And they, maybe the next three weeks, I don't watch anything on that. But it's always there. I'm paying a monthly fee that, that is affordable, that is affordable. And, and you know, if, I, if we said to, uh, say, the adult students that, that are in our platform, if we said, look, if you paid, uh, say, $50 a month for the next 10 years and you can access all the educational content you need when you need it, my guess is that, uh, that, that people would really value the ability to do that. And I think that's where it's headed uh, and because, you know, you and I know the financial model of higher ed is unsustainable. Um, it's unsustainable on any level. Uh, we've been able to lower tuition here, and we're on a trajectory to lower uh, traditional tuition another 20% over the next few years, um, and we're very proud of that. But I think systemically, it's going to radically change the cost structure over the next five years. I think if you and I are sitting here at 2030, and we're looking back at this decade, we will say that this decade ushered in a golden era of education. Yeah, gave us a great opportunity. and. You know, we it, it gives whole new meaning to the word lifelong learning. I remember 25, 30 years ago, lifelong learning meant go take a cooking class at the community college or head out yeah. there and get your real estate license. But lifelong learning now has a different life to it. It really means we will continue to learn and somebody's got to provide the vehicles and the tools for us to be able to do that forever. Absolutely. I saw a study recently. I, I don't want to name the publication because I'm not sure. I want to get it I'm confused which one it might be. But the bottom line was that, that most experts believe now that everybody who's employed in any profession currently is going to have to skill up every three to four years for the foreseeable future. And let's face it, Joanne, you can't, you can't go back to school every three years and, and, and get a master's degree. So the, the, that continuous lifelong educational flow, right, of, of learn this and develop this. And there has to be a seamless and a, I'll just say it, a customer centric way of delivering that to people so that they can access it when they need it and in the ways that they need it. And that's, again, another evolution of that entire uh, adult learning environment that we talked about earlier. Um, But I think you're right. Lifelong learning is here to stay, including even for for us. I think we're 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 having to learn stuff all the time. I I I told somebody the other day. I've uh, I think I've been in school more in the last year and a half than I've been in a long time. I Learning. think you're absolutely right. And you know, I've been retired for eight years, and I find <laughs> I have to learn a new software program every six months or so. That's right. <laughs> for something for something that I need to do or want to do for sure. Well, absolutely. let's uh, let's it, as we come towards the end of our time together. I, I really would like you to talk about something that is um, that the, a lot of people don't think about, but you've thought about it a lot. And that is how this is going to affect space. You've built a beautiful campus there at Maryville. You, uh, you've done all the right things to make the experience for students right there on campus. But how does all this affect your thinking about space for the future? Oh, it's huge. I mean, we... Um... And, and this goes back to being students operating on multiple platforms. I think, and I'm going to probably blow some people's minds when I say this, I think we have to think of space as, op, as 
physical space as operating in, on two or three channels at once. And, and the only way to explain this, I think, is to use an example. So, so you might have what, what you'd consider a traditional classroom or a conference room, say, that you see on every campus in the United States. It's going to have to have the technological ability to literally uh, have people in the physical space at times and also have people projected into that space. And if you want to think of it, think of it like the old hologra holograms on Star Trek, right? So you might have a space where you've got five people who are literally physically there and you've got another 20 people who are being projected into that space but are able to engage and interact with each other just like you and I are engaging and interacting with each other right now. That's one example of... So, so the space doesn't become a question of capacity and size and what have you. It really co becomes a question of how can you operate on multiple channels at the same time. And I'll just use an example that's happening now. You and I are talking, and as our viewers might remember, I got, I got four great people here with wires and, and hookups and microphones and cameras, and right? And they're doing a great job of keeping all of this on track. We've got to get to a point where those physical spaces, and it will be this decade, those can operate with all of this with a couple of flicks of a switch and a couple of clicks. So you don't need to, to have good people devoting a large part of their day to all of that. So the design of physical space, it has to start with the depth of the technology, for lack of a better term, but the ability of that technology to bring people into that space from all kinds of locations in real time, and also how to flip and, and make that space as flexible as possible. So I would venture to say, and Credo is very involved in this, as, I, as you know, uh, uh, movable walls and flexible technology and all kinds of things that allow you to... Um, Utilize a space. I'll say this: a classroom might have been utilized uh, in two different ways in, in at one time. Now it has to be utilized in twenty different ways. And I, so we're going to need physical space, but but its flexibility and its sophistication is going to be. And by the way, this is going to happen in homes too. It's going to happen everywhere, uh, architecturally and otherwise. I, I would think it was a, it's an exciting time to be an architect and and a designer if you're if you're working if you're if you're in these things because it, it there's some amazing things coming amazing things happening already well you know that uh, as a as an educator a college educator it was it was it was different for me to join hands with a firm 20 years ago that had architects in it. And yet what drew me then, and I think what draws us now and what's going to be part of the future is that this was a group that thought about the experience in the space, not just about how it looked, not just about the walls, but the experience that could happen there. And that's what you're talking about. We're going to have to think experientially to make We've that happen. The design of any space, classroom, re of course, resident, but any space has got to start with the student experience and the student outcomes you're trying to achieve. Uh, it doesn't start with, here's how I like to teach. It doesn't start with, here's how we can organize students. It really has to do with how, how are they going to use it and what are the outcomes they're trying to achieve. And, um, and I find that exciting because we're, if we're talking about traditional age students, younger generation, the students coming to us today cannot remember a time where they didn't have a smartphone or an iPad or tablet. So they're coming into this, no, these notions of space and whatever with, with radically different ideas about it than certainly you and I had, um, uh, I'll say a few years ago. Uh, and, and, and so in that sense, the sky's the limit, you know, in terms of what we can do with that. Um, I'm uh, a, a concrete example, before the pandemic, we had an expansion of our academic complex on the, as you know, on the drawing board and design. Now we're re-envisioning everything about the interior of that space uh, as we move forward. Not a rat, because we had some of these concepts built into that design, but there's some other concepts that we need to, we need to embrace and bring in as well. So I, I find all that change exciting, uh, energizing. Uh, I get bored easy, so maybe that's why I love change so much. But, uh, but the good news is, we talked about earlier, we've been able to create and build a culture that embraces the change, and, and, and that's exciting to watch.
and do some things we never thought we would ever do. It even, even for us, for the two of us, I would have never thought that in my retirement years, I could have helped you with a project on the Maryville campus without traveling there, which we right. did this year, which was really fun to do together. And, and it we didn't miss a beat on it because I wasn't present. And that's going to give us all access to each other in a number of ways. If we can stand uh, to be on Zoom as much as we have to be on Zoom, <laughs> we'll have to figure out some new ways to use Zoom. That's for sure. Well, yeah, Zoom, I found I found it an effective tool, but it's also one that you've got to uh, uh, you got to find a balance on how often you use it. Right. <laughs> You really, really do. Well, Mark, I I can't tell you how uh, privileged it was to be asked to talk about this with you today, and to you know, for everybody here at Credo, we we've, we've been privileged to be on the journey with you. You and I started that journey as soon as you got to be president there, and That's so it's right. been a long one, and it's been a privilege to watch it, a privilege to brag about it, uh, and then a privilege to write about it. So we we all here appreciate that so much. Well, and I can't say enough, not only that, that you took the time for us to have this conversation and dialogue and maybe down the road we, we can do it again. But the other the other part is, uh, uh, you know, walking with Credo uh, over these 15 years or so has been wonderful because I've watched Credo uh, not develop and evolve and become an innovative and cutting edge. You were innovative 15 years ago, but you've you've adapted to the innovation that we've been talking about here, just as Maryville has. And so that's been fantastic to watch as well and, uh, and exciting and, and the great people there. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I miss going to North Carolina and, uh, I know, I know it's, I miss you. I miss you doing that. Yeah. It's, it speaks well of, uh, retirement when I think that was eight years ago that I retired from the leadership of Prado. And I look at them now and think they're a hundred times better than we were were and no one is indispensable let's just say that that's right that's right <laughs> new no, it, leadership rises and and they do things in a wonderful way well we we didn't talk about it in this podcast maybe another time but one of the you know this better than anybody because you've done it and you and tom and and we're doing it in maryville is you you have a moral and ethical responsibility to build a deep and talented bench of people who can't who who are ready to lead and ready to to shape and and that is a, a I know you. I feel strongly that that's a huge responsibility of mine, and we've done. You you know many of those people, and you did it at Credo, and you and Tom, and and that's another piece that uh, anyone leading a university has to. And you get that you got to put the time and energy into that that good work. That building of the bench. That's absolutely right. Well, have we worn ourselves out? Well, uh, if for now we, we'll uh, we'll take a we'll take a coffee break and we'll be back at twenty. No, I'm kidding, but uh, I'm looking forward to the next time we we get a chance to chat without the without the cameras and the microphones. All right, I think that's Monday. Monday. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. We'll Thanks, see you Joanne. Then. All right. Take thank care. you. And thank you to everyone who joining Disruptor in Chief. Take care. Thank you for joining us for Disruptor in Chief. Please share this episode with people in your network who might benefit from it. We'll see you next time.